all the knowledge that could be had about a company's products. You put on Apple Vision Pro. Those products are selling well. And management. Steve Jobs has oh, resigned. Steve. Scandals, good news, bad news. By lowering our policy interest rate by AI. Analyst reports everything is built into the chart. What actually goes on behind the chart? What is the basis of it? Hi, my name is Tim Knight, and I'm here to teach you about the philosophy of charting. I've been using charting as a basis for my own decision since 1987. I have looked at literally millions and millions and millions of charts over the decades I've been doing this. Over the course of this, I, I find it's easier to talk about philosophy of charting if we're actually looking at charts together. So what I'm gonna do here in a moment is share with you my screen and the platform I'll be using is my own, which is slopecharts.com. All right, so here we have a chart. And this is the Spider, which is the best known and highest volume ETF that exists. This data goes all the way back to uh, 1993 when it was created. And it captures neatly a tremendous amount of United States history, both financial and otherwise. I would also say there's nothing we're going to do in this video that has to do with analyzing the markets. And that's not what this is about. It's really more about the principles and the uh, impetus behind where those price wiggles and jiggles come from. There are a few general concepts that we're going to focus on along the lines of support and resistance. As the name suggests, support being where in a chart is the price holding up? What is considered the floor? Which if it breaks is bad news. Resistance is just the opposite of that, which is what is the ceiling? By way of example, this spider chart here, this has a long channel. This goes on for about 15 years. And you can see resistance can be represented neatly by this line at the top. So the price tries to push above it, resistance, 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 and so forth. The kinds of items I like to use really aren't complicated technical indicators and a lot of sophisticated mathematics and stochastics and RSIs and all the rest of it. I prefer the simplicity and really the beauty of classic patterns. The things as simple as rounded tops here or ascending price channels, or rounded bottoms like this one, or wedges like this one. Let's get into some specific examples and we'll sort of tease out some of these notions in the world of charting. And the first one I'll start with is a symbol called COLD, K-O-L-D, which happens to be an ETF dedicated to uh, natural gas. I also wanna emphasize in this video that there's nothing specific about these symbols that, well, for gas you do this, and for tech stocks you do that. It's really nothing, the symbol's almost immaterial. It actually is immaterial. It's just a bunch of wiggly lines and certain drawn objects on it mean. What this illustrates very nicely is a support and resistance because this tent I've drawn here for years represented support for this instrument, even though it's a leveraged instrument, which makes it all the more extraordinary. It had lots of ups and downs, but as it approached this level, it found support and it rallied and it worked its way down and once again found support and it rallied and worked its way down again. This is a big change here. It broke support and tried to get back into that pattern again, but it failed hard. This is what I refer to as a transition because what happened was the level here, this price level still existed, but it changed roles before it had been support. Once this transition took place, it became resistance. Years later, after it fell and began to rally mightily, pushed and pushed and pushed higher. As it approached this, you can almost sense the exhaustion that it cannot muster its way back to that level. That's a vital important concept to understand this notion of the role reversal of support versus resistance. Here is a very different, very bullish item, which is GC, which is the continuous contract of gold futures. Gold has been through in this multi-decade chart, kind of three broad phases. One of them is long ascent right here, which is this kind of un unrelenting bull market that uh, went on year after year after year and really didn't exhaust itself until the August of 2011. Then it seemed to stumble badly. And of course, those holding gold at the time would be very disappointed because this marvelous rally just fell to pieces. With the benefit of hindsight, we could see what was really going on was it was forming this beautiful base, which really had two components to it. One of them is I've tended in green here, this is a nice rounded bottom. And then this larger tent is a superset of that, a pattern within a pattern. And this was a tremendous pattern here, which is called a cup with handle. In this instance, the cup is 
roughly this zone right here that I'm sweeping out. And the handle is this portion here. And the pattern is complete when it breaks above right around here. This is no small pattern. This spent years and years, really over a decade for me. And when it finally burst forth from that, it was very powerful. And so you can see here, as we zoom in, it was accelerating toward a breakout back in late February, 2024. It went from around $2,000 an ounce to around $2,700 an ounce in just a few months time. So you can see what a clean and powerful pattern that was. It's a great example of a cup with handle. Those don't come along very often, certainly not with that kind of clarity. XLE, this is an energy select sector. Now let's talk a bit about repetition. And in this instance, we've got a series of three tops right here. And let's think about the people behind this. These are real humans with real money and they love profits and they hate losses. If it was just one individual, it would be very specific to that person, but it isn't one person. It's thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people all with a stake in a given instrument. And the reason that's important is because people's behavior in the aggregate doesn't really change with time. People's relationship in the aggregate with a particular financial instrument also doesn't change over time. And so that's why if you have an instance in which you see a formation followed by a fall and a similar formation followed by a fall and another one followed by a fall, what that suggests is in the future, should you see something like this shaping up and just as important complete that suggests it is probable that it's going to do what it did in the past. This is known as an analog. That's especially important to recognize. It has to do with the mass of humanity's relationship with that particular instrument, because some items do not act like this. If we had three rounded tops like this, and in every case it didn't fall, but instead when blasting higher, clearly it has a very different meaning for that particular stock than it does for XLE here. Uh, right there, it's important to recognize two vital concepts in an analogy, as well as the importance of the repetition and what that means in the future. Let's take a look at something uh, very long term. These are colloquially known as the cubes, the QQQ, another big ETF. This illustrates several things from a charting perspective. We have a rounded top here, a rounded bottom, a rounded bottom, and this very long trend line. Let's hone in on this fellow right here because this was clearly a pattern that preceded a gargantuan bull market. And this is a style of pattern you've probably heard about called the inverted head and shoulders. And all that means here is that we have what's called a shoulder here. This is the left shoulder. And then this tremendous thing here is the head. And then we have our right shoulder here. And the top of that pattern is referred to as the neckline. To kind of walk through the psychology of what would be going on with uh, all the owners of the cubes watching this carefully. We had a rally going for years, the beginnings of a fall. We tried to rally again, but it, it broke. So this series of higher lows and higher highs was terminated right here. It broke below the most recent higher low and plunged at that point. Now it fell about as far as it was going to fall in the autumn of 2008 and it began to try to rally again and that definitely had some steam going and it got up to here and began to fall again the interesting thing is even at its weakest it did not descend any lower than over here the left shoulder and then began to get strength and it pushed up and then pushed out of that pattern above the neckline and the reason this is important from a human perspective is because the mass of people who are long the cubes at this point will all be in the green. Gains tend to beget more gains and losses tend to beget more losses that feeds on itself. And in this instance, after broke out of the neckline, there was some uncertainty here briefly, but following that, as you can see, it was the beginning of a multi-decade rally, which as of this recording still hasn't ended. So this was a very important base. This happens to be crude oil futures over the course of many decades. And we can see three prior instances here, 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 and here of these rounded tops. This top here was a funny one because it fell a little and then wiggled around for a few more months before it really began to plunge. But I think we can agree on a couple of things. First, it seems that these rounded tops 
once they're pierced to the downside, do have a very negative effect on the price in the months ahead. And as of this recording, this is heading close to that same situation. It's also important to realize, and I said earlier, it doesn't really matter what the symbol is. Let me put an asterisk on that. There is a pretty key difference between commodities and stocks. Because with a stock, like let's say NVIDIA, you have revenue growth, profit growth. A company can literally grow tens of thousands of percent over the course of time. Commodities aren't quite like that. They're going to be more range bound. They're going to be more cyclic. You're not going to wake up in a decade and find out that oil is $5,000 a barrel. Over the course of decades here, as you can see, it has been range bound, even though a lot has happened. Also related to commodities is the miners. This is GDX. Here I'd like to talk a bit about trend lines. And this really harkens back to the importance of support and resistance. So let's just zoom in on recent history here. And you notice these very simple lines, like so. And when a line is broken past a certain zone, that is typically bullish if it breaks the upside or bearish breaks the downside. In this instance, we've got several lines going. Let's look at this blue line in particular. So in this instance, it had bottomed and it was working its way higher up and then down. And it got strength again and went down. And it was doing fine until here. So the trend line is anchored to this low and to this low right here, but right here, it broke that trend line. The trend was literally broken. It didn't plunge after that, but it definitely meant that the uptrend seemed to have terminated for the time being. And sure enough, for many, many months, it hung out below that broken trend line, really spoiling what had been a nice ascent. Now, another principle here that's important to remember is that the longer a given pattern is, or trend line or anything in terms of time, the more powerful the consequence of a breakout or a breakdown is. Let's take this particularly long trend line right here. This was a descending trend line. It was serving as resistance. So we had resistance here, we had resistance here. And then finally, that's that phase change again, that roll change from resistance to support. And I would submit that given the longevity of this trend line, it goes back um, about half a decade plus, the fact that it's broken out makes this a particularly potent breakout for GDX because it's been a long time coming. Here's GDXJ. All right, so we've got a mass of people who own this particular instrument, which is the Junior Miters, and it's having a nice rally here. Then it begins to stall and it falls, and that's disappointing, but then it rallies again. And so people see new highs in this uptrend. That's very encouraging, very positive. Then to their disappointment, it falls again. Now they're starting to get worried. This is going to be a bit of a habit with this thing. It goes up again, fails to match its prior high, and then down again, and then up again. So all this congestion, plus the fact that it has stopped making new highs, it's actually changed its trend, is going to cause a lot of anxiety amongst all these people. And they're going to get really anxious when we break below this range. So it falls hard, and the weakest of hands are going to get out in a big hurry. They're going to sell fast. Then it's beginning to rally because all those back here who had wished they'd bought will get back in because it's quote unquote cheap at this point. But here's the important thing is the notion of overhead supply. And what I mean by that is you've got all these people who paid these prices for this particular object. They, in some cases, are going to want out. They've seen a nasty loss and they're willing to take a smaller loss if possible. Therefore, the more it pushes toward the price points of all these owners, the more of them are going to hit that sell button and get out of there. So that's selling pressure. That is a consequence of overhead supply. That's why it acts as a barrier. And that really goes to the point of what I was making at the top of this video, which is how there's human emotions and fear and greed all operating behind the scenes, hammering out what the chart's actually doing. So in this instance, we do have a nice head and shoulders pattern, which tries again and again to push itself into the pattern, but ultimately it fails. And after it does fail, the consequences are pretty calamitous because it falls for a very, very long time. Here's the USDJPY, that is the cross rate between the US dollar and the Japanese yen. And this is a nice example of how simplicity pays off. All along the way, you've, you haven't seen a single indicator. You haven't seen multiple panes of uh, all kinds of crazy mathematical concoctions going on. Very simple trend lines and tints here and there of different patterns. So in this case, we have this pattern right here, which is a right triangle. And 
This speaks beautifully not only to the potency of a breakout, but also the, the notion of reversal of roles, because this red line had been resistance for a long time. Try as it might, it could not get past that. And the last time I made an earnest effort to do so was here. It fell back and then pushed through finally. And so the trend line changed from resistance to support, and the long period had a lot of pent up energy. So once it broke out, it broke out big. And so you can see the US dollar appreciated mightily against the Japanese yen for years to come. Now, it doesn't have to be stocks or commodities. I believe just about anything is chartable, anything which has human decisions behind it. It could be interest rates, it could be the popularity of movies, pretty much anything that changes with time and has human decisions powering those changes. And so here we have the U.S. two-year treasury rate. This is just interest rates. And it illustrates very nicely interest rates have tops and bottoms too. Here's a round the top on interest rates that took place back in 2018. And you can see following that, we plunged into the lowest interest rates in the history of the United States. Then down here, we formed this rounded bottom. Throughout 2020 and early 2021, we were essentially at 0% interest as that ZERP back then. We formed this uh, powerful rounded bottom and went exploding higher. Look at what's going on here. Not just another round the top, but a nice big one. This is about twice as big as what had taken place here. Going back to our notion of analogs, what this suggests to me is that interest, interest rates are probably going to be heading lower following this particular topping pattern. Let's wrap up with. Um, uh, final symbols to talk about uh, these concepts one last time. This is nothing but trend lines here. This looks like a pickup stick scheme. This is SLV, the uh, iShare Silver Trust. And you can just see here again and again, resistance like so, breakouts like here, and how you can lay down different ones of these lines over the course of a, of a financial instrument's history to dictate what are important levels of support and resistance, but also what constitutes a breakout. So most recently here, we zoom in on silver, we can see that this neckline was holding prices back and it broke out here. Having effected the change from uh, resistance to support, it held nicely on this fall as well as this fall. And then finally went shooting higher and broke yet another much smaller resistance line. This is known as the SOX, the semiconductor index. And it neatly shows the importance of long-term trends. You can see right here, this trend line, which has held literally for uh, well over 15 years and also illustrates just how far prices are from major support. In other words, there could be a calamitous bear market starting here and it would be a long, long way to go before even tagged uh, that support line. Those who are in this thing are on the whole profitable. That's probably the final concept that's important to recognize, which is, as I said earlier, profits beget profits, losses beget losses. There's an entirely unique psychology that goes on when an instrument is making lifetime highs or lifetime lows. They tend to feed on themselves. And if there's any time where charting is trickier, it's when you're heading to lows that have never been seen and highs that have never been seen because you don't have those easy boundaries to work with uh, as much as you do, as opposed to a situation like this, where there's price action all over the place and you can lay down some simple parameters about where price is bounded. I suppose, above all, keep things simple because what you're trying to do is to give yourself an insight into that hive mind, if you will, of all those people behind those decisions and make it easy for yourself to discern when are things going right, things, when are things going wrong. And in a way, it's more important to know when things are going wrong. And that's where I think charts are the most powerful. When you lay down properly objects, such as the drawn objects, the patterns, the lines, all you need to decide is what constitutes a failure. I am making this decision based upon this rationale. What would constitute a failure of that rationale? It could be something as simple as, I'm going to be along the stock as long as it stays above this trend line. That's your rationale, and that's perfectly okay. So long as it does that, you stick with it. The vital thing to do, and which is hard for a lot of people to do, is if the price breaks whatever that thing is, be it a trend line, it breaks a pattern, or one moving average just crosses another moving average, whatever that instance may hold to basically obey yourself, 
and to execute that because if the rationale has been violated, then there's no logical reason to remain with that. Unfortunately, people are very good at talking themselves out of it and saying, well, I'm going to give this another day or maybe it's different this time and so forth. So being tough on yourself about those rules, that'll make the training valuable to you. Most importantly, why they represent in the aggregate all those buying and selling decisions from all the mass of people out who are trading along with you and how you can use good charting as kind of an x-ray vision into that psyche and determine when is there a buying opportunity and much more important when is the time to take profits or losses and hang it up thanks a lot for your attention and i'll see you around